call black everything Everything black, culture over everything Y'all, we taking it back, black Welcome to Left of Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We're joined today by writer and producer Felicia Pride. Uh, Felicia, uh, you and I go back a while to yes. our days at Pop Matters and, yes. and, and to try to track all the stuff that you've done <laughs> in this last decade or so is, is definitely a mouthful. mouthful. So you're the head of Pride Collaborative, an interactive studio, director of the Storytelling Institute, Story Lead. The founder of The Creative Daily, a startup that matches media makers with career advancing opportunities, as well as the author of several books, including The Message, 100 Life Lessons from Hip Hop's Greatest Songs, which was published in 2007, and most recently, To Create, Black writers, filmmakers, storytellers, artists, and media makers riff on art, careers, life, and the beautiful mess in between. How are you doing today, Felicia? Good. Thank you so much for having me. I mean, I love Left of Black. I love what you're doing. And you've always been so supportive of my career. So I'm really, really appreciative of this moment. Let me start just broadly with some of the work that you're doing. I, I think you understood the curve, you know, well ahead of many folks. I mean, you were already thinking about multiple platforms and digital platforms, you know, a decade ago before folks could even wrap their heads around <laughs> what it was. I mean, what was it about your kind of view of the world that made you think in this kind of multi-platform way? I think it was two things. I mean, I was working in book publishing and in marketing, and um, I really felt like book publishers were kind of missing the boat a little bit because they were so fixated on format versus content. Mm -hmm. And I felt like the big, big sort of gold mine for book publishers was content and thinking about the fact that, number one, books are new if you've never heard of it, right? Um, and then also, how do we reach audiences who may prefer that story in a different method that's not a hardcover book? I mean, publish, book, book publishing did not want paperbacks when paperbacks came out. They didn't want ebooks. They didn't want audiobooks. You know, it was this idea of this hardcover experience, which is very valuable and I love it myself. But thinking about different ways to reach audiences um, as a marketer had me thinking about that. And also looking at books as more than just the book, looking at it as an experience, looking at it as a project. How can we add elements that will bring in different audiences? Um, so that's kind of where that part part came from. And then I started teaching around the same time that I was in book publishing. And you think about the classroom and the physical space and the limitations. And then yeah. you think about all the different yeah. learners in the classroom. How can I reach them? How can I deliver this message in a way that'll reach them? So thinking about their interests, thinking about where they're coming from, thinking about how they prefer to receive messages, all that together kind of helped me think more broadly about um, story and content. What kind of challenges, you know, has your work posed, particularly in terms of someone who does black content, who helps other folks circulate black content? You know, have you found it has been much easier to deliver content in these multi-platform ways to black audiences or, or more difficult? I mean, I think it's always been the pushback. Um, of number one, you know, the format should be this way and this is how it's going to be. We're not even going to think about, you know, changing the format, changing the platform. I think that's been one of the biggest challenges is the pushback from there. Um, also thinking about challenges with mis misconceptions around whether people are ready for different types of platforms. Yeah. Um, and then also just this sort of like... Er um, yeah, arrogance of, of a sense that, you know, we, people should come to us. So we're not actually going to go to the people. People need to find us and come to us versus, you know, if your audience is in the barbershop, that's where you need to be. If your audience is on Twitter, that's where you need to be. So I think those have been some of the biggest challenges is kind of breaking through um, preconceived notions as well as just, you know, this is how things have always been done. You're watching Left of Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We're joined today by Felicia Pride, writer and producer, and specifically talking about your new film projects. Uh, the End Again, which is a short film and a prequel to Open Ended, uh, both films about relationships in flux. Um, How did you end up making this move to filmmaking? <laughs> you know, I, I think after books, um, I started, well, after writing fiction, let's put it that way. Fiction comes very, very hard to me. 
Um, and I was like, I don't know if I, I have this in me. I think it's because I kind of always feel like I don't have enough imagination to write really good fiction. Like I can't <laughs> describe the way the room looks in two pages. You know, I kind of want to get to the heart of things. Um, and that also comes from a lot of the nonfiction work that I had done. I love nonfiction as a form, but I love the idea of fictional storytelling. So I just was like, you know what? I kind of want to take my hands at writing a screenplay. Um, and when I started the process, I was enamored by this sort of hybrid where you have this very um, economical storytelling. You know, you have to yeah, be very economical yeah, with yeah. your words. Um, but also the challenge of I now can't go into people's heads. I can only write what people see. So that still remains a challenge to me because I want to be. And I'm also like very flowery with my language. So <laughs> I have to kind of pull that back. But it's been a unique challenge that I feel like is this nice blend between sort of the journalism that I had been doing and the fiction that I was struggling with now I have this form that's new to me that's exciting and so I took my stab at that actually I began writing the screenplay for Open Ended in 2008 um, and I happened to go to American Black Film Festival in 2010 and was just walking around heard my name called come to find out it's a old colleague of mine Letitia Fortune who we worked together at my first job out of college. Mm -hmm. And come to find out, she's doing production work and great stuff with film and TV in Atlanta. I have this screenplay. She wants to do more independent producing. We got together. Um, and so, you know, things kind of, we were working on things, but we were like, what can we do to get some momentum going? What can we do? You know, that's our big thing now is what can we keep doing? So the idea in bringing on Crystal Roberson, who was a dope, 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 um, director based in Atlanta. Um, why don't we do something that's short? Why don't we do a short project and see what happens? So we decided to do a prequel, um, and that's the end again, and it takes place four years prior to mm -hmm. the feature film Open Ended, and we shot it in a hectic two days in Atlanta, Georgia in January, released it through our first screening in February, and it's been quite a journey since then. Talk about uh, who you cast in terms of the, the starring roles of the couple, couple that's yeah. at the centerpiece of the film. <laughs> so we, our first um, uh, character cast was for Jane, and that was from by Tanee McCall. She did an audition tape that blew us all away. I mean, literally, we were like, okay, that's Jane. Um, and so then we started setting up chemistry reads for our Joe. Um, and... You know, after a while, Tani came to us and said, you know, Columbus said, Columbus Short will said he'll do it. Now, who happened to be her husband said he'll do it. And we were like, and this is at the height of scandal and mm -hmm. everything. And we actually hadn't thought about him for Joe, <laughs> quite frankly. I didn't see him as Joe. Um, but okay. Um, and they both came down and put on tremendous performances. Um, tremendous, tremendous performances. I think, of course, the fact that they were a couple had a lot to do with the, chem the chemistry that was already on there. But that's what happened. And then there's, yeah, so. <laughs> the, the rest is what the rest is. Uh, you know, the film is so beautifully shot. Um, and it's moody. It's grown. You know, because I think that's one of the things that we don't see enough of. I mean, even in films like like, you know, the best man and, and the best man too, you know, where they're, they're dealing with some grown images and, and grown ideas and, and, and grown concepts. There was something very grown about this film. Um, and, 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 and part of it had to do with the soundtrack. I mean, talk about how important it was to be able to bring on foreign exchange, you know, to help create the sound of the visuals for the film. Yeah, I do want to give a shout out to Jay Christopher Campbell, who is our DP, mm -hmm. um, who we owe so much to for the look and the feel of, of the film. Um, you know, so I, I started writing about music, and so music has always been a really important part of my life and the work that I do. Um, and I, I don't know, I just, I, I wanted something, I just, I just felt like music would be such an important component of this project, um, including the feature. So I've reached out to Fonte just on a humble, as I did with the message, like years ago, I reached out to Fonte on MySpace and was like, Hey, I'm doing this book. And he since then has been so gracious with his time and support and was like, all right, you know, he read the script. He was like, let's do it. Let's make it happen. And it was history from there, and I really feel like that that the music, in addition to bringing on the composer Deus Cannon to help us um, really fill in and how the music should fit, um, really plays an important 
important role in the film. And they, in Foreign Exchange, we actually had a great screening in Pittsburgh, and we had a talk back with Fonte, and then they performed at this Dream On concert in Pittsburgh. So it's been a really, really great partnership. You're watching Left of Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We're joined by Felicia Pride, who is a writer and producer of the two films. The film short, The End Again, which is a prequel to Open Ended. Talk a little bit about some of the challenges. Um, you know, it's a brave new world now for filmmaking. Um, there's a way in which black filmmakers have always crowdfunded. Yeah. <laughs> you know, whether it's Robert, Robert Townsend using 27 of his, <laughs> his credit cards or, or Spike, you know, just rolling up on folks, give me $100 or what have you. But at least now that, you know, there's an institutional, uh, you know, framing now to be able to do this kind of, of crowdfunding. Have you found that folks have been responsive, you know, to being being able to help you, you know, create the finances for, you know, the the second part of this of this film project? Yeah, you know, um, the crowdfunding has definitely been a challenge. Um, it is hard work <laughs> launching, launching. We launched an Indiegogo campaign when we released the short online, and it's definitely been hard work. But what's been gratifying is the response that we've been getting to the work. Um, so of course, it's always about what's the connection between the two. But for me, and and maybe I'm just because I'm new at the filmmaking game, just to hear people first of all watch it, <laughs> and then comment on it has been tremendous. Um, we actually had sold out screenings in Atlanta mm -hmm. and in DC. We had screenings at like lounges and and um, had DJs. And the fact that people paid money to come see a short film right. Um, right. actually meant a lot to us. Um, Letitia and I. Uh, self-finance that short film, uh, you know, just off of faith. But since then, I feel like we've gotten a lot of support, whether it's been in-kind support, um, it's been just moral support, and then the financial support. So what we're doing is crowdfunding in order to uh, raise additional funds to go after the big money. Um, the budget that we have for open-ended, the feature is 1.5. Um, so that's what we're crowdfunding for to go after the, the tools and resources that we need to go after the big money. You've been working with Ava DuVernay uh, as part of her film distribution company, AFFRM. Um, talk a little bit about, you know, how important this development is as we try to be able to get black film to actually reach black audiences. I mean, even back in the day, I think we can all remember when a Spike Lee film would come out and, and you'd be frustrated if it didn't quite make it to your neighborhood or even didn't even make it to your city if you were in like small town America. Um, how important is it, ha is it to have an African-American company that's devoted to distributing black film at this point? I mean, well, it's crazy because I met Ava at Black Lily when she was um, screening her documentary, her hip hop documentary, This Is The Life. Mm -hmm. And I was hawking copies of the message, <laughs> one of which that she purchased. Um, and I think that was in 2008. So to see what she has been able to accomplish in a very short, short period time, yeah. um, on the directing side, but also like on the let me bring people up with me side. So I, I don't know if people really understand the magnitude of what she's doing in terms of um, creating a distribution company, right? Because one of the big things that challenges us as content creators of color is distribution, right? So YouTube is wonderful, but that's still somebody else's platform. Right. So she actually has come up with a very, very innovative strategy using film festivals and other partners to distribute films, which is a really, really big deal. Um, so that's what a firm is doing, and, it, and it's amazing, amazing work. In addition to creating her own content um, and and you know presenting marginalized faces and voices is is pretty awesome. So it's 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 so so remarkable what she's doing but also I feel like it's inspirational. Um you know, you hear a lot of people talk about the work that she's doing and I hope that it opens up other doors for people to disrupt the distribution channels, to disrupt the financing channels um so that we can make more and and be able to reach more people. I mean, that's the irony. I mean, it's not that we have lack of stories to tell, right? We have so many stories to tell, but, you know, just trying to be able to get the financing and the support and, and find the right platform to tell those stories have been so much of a challenge. You know, as someone who's been kind of uh, yourself, a, a critic of pop black popular culture for some time, you know, when you see a, a television program like Blackish, you know, what, what's your immediate response? You know, have, have we seen tremendous gains or is this kind of a back step? Well, I love Blackish. I, I, I do too, if I'm honest. I do too. <laughs> I thought the first episode, 
know a lot of people, you know, were kind of uh, about the first episode. I thought it was actually quite bold for ABC um, in terms of that space. Um, I, I thought it. I, I I knew that it was it was. It's something kind of like there's an exaggeration about it that I like, wow. um, and I just I, I think it's I think it's smart and I think it's fun and I think it's family friendly. Um, yeah. So to me, Blackish is a really big deal. I feel like we haven't had a black a black comedy that folks are watching and black family comedy that folks are watching in quite some time. Um, so I think it's a really really big deal, and I think this is an interesting time in television. Um, for people of color, we're seeing more of them on the screen. I mean, there was a time where it was like we didn't have any shows with like, like more than one black cast member on TV for a long, right. long time. It was this big, like, just dry period, and I think that we're seeing seeing more. And the fact that it's also a black showrunner, right? So I think that's also what we have to remember: is not just a show with black that characters, right. but having a black creator um, and showrunner is huge. Um, that's big. I, I mean, you look at Thursday nights on, on that same network. Um, yeah. You know, how you have, you know, ble- three black shows with three, you know, with black showrunners, but the shows aren't really black. <laughs> you know, the fact that there are black folks there, you know, it's almost kind of happenstance, but it's clear, right, you know, in terms of who's driving the narrative. Yeah, I mean, but I think Shonda has been very savvy with that. I mean, I think that there, she's very purposeful um, in how she's been able to to do that. What are you listening to these days, Felicia? Oh my gosh, I'm so behind. <laughs> I feel like I've got behind on is my music. Like I, I have the same. I listen to my um, Pandora a lot, so that I just have an artist who. But I'm so. I used to be. I thought that I used to be kind of like <laughs> on the cutting edge, but I'm not anymore. So if you have suggestions, please. please. <laughs> I'm over here struggling. <laughs> You've been watching Left to Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony. We've been joined today by Felicia Pride. And, and, and be patient with me as I read this mouthful of achievements. <laughs> the head of Pride Collaborative, an interactive studio, director of, storytelling, of the Storytelling Institute, Stories Lead, the founder of Create, The Create Daily, a startup that matches media makers with career advancing opportunities, the author of several books, including The Message, 100 Life Lessons from Hip Hop's Greatest Songs, and most recently, To Create Black Writers, Filmmakers, Storytellers, Artists, and Media Makers Riff on Art, Careers, Life, and the Beautiful Mess in Between. And of course, she's the writer and producer of the film short The End Again, which is a prequel to the full-length film Open-Ended, in which she is raising money for as we speak. Thanks for joining us today, Felicia. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. I love what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Black lights and booze burn when I record for watch And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot All black everything, everything black Culture over everything